Fantastic, and welcome to this Quantum Woo episode with, of course, <laughs> my co-host for tonight. You can find her on YouTube at Mariam Henin and on her new Twitter. We'll get into that in a few moments here at B Lady. Welcome back, Mariam. How are you? Nice to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to have you back, Mariam. And of course, tonight we have a beautiful, new, interesting, awesome, and amazing guest with us. You can find her at dennycats.com and also at quantumlanguaging.com and also on Instagram. Let's give her a big, warm welcome to the Beyond Mystic audience. Denny, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Excited Yay. to have you. Danny, okay, before we start, I'm, I'm excited to have you. I've done a lot of research here for this episode, and I'm very, very thankful for Mariam for bringing you onto the show. And I want to uh, basically ask you our first time um, interviewer guest question here for the audience here, and it goes something like this. Danny, how did Universe conspire to bring you to the work you're doing today? Uh, um, are we talking about my quantum languaging work? <laughs> you can start where you want and I'll drill down after that, okay? Okay, well, all first right. of all, all, the universe conspired by birthing me as an Aquarius. Okay. <laughs> Zero degrees Aquarius sun um, and north node. So my devotion to humanity was kind of embedded in my cosmic blueprint before I hit the ground. And then, um, like Miriam, I'm a journalist, a writer, so I've, I've been working with words my whole life, and I went through an intensely shamanic spell, lots of plant medicine, and during that time, um, I was a very serious Ashtanga yogi, and a very serious yoga practice, and I went to bed one night, a healthy human, and I woke up the next morning crippled, paralyzed, unable to move, intense amounts of pain, um, I had five compressed discs in my upper cervical spine, and I was basically just on the couch for a month. And I was going back and forth to my bookshelf, keeping myself busy, and I found this book called uh, Hidden Language Codes by R. Neville Johnson. I had no idea where this book came from, didn't know how it ended up in my library. And um, the book was about a man, R. Neville Johnson, who was shot point blank in the chest six times, and when he died, he downloaded these languaging codes. So after I read the book, um, words started to speak to me multidimensionally, and I started to see the effects they were having on people as people spoke them. And it got really witchy and weird. And because I was working with words all the time, it was like a constant battle. It was like the words were trying to talk to me, and I'm like, I'm on a deadline. Like, I can't play the witchy word game with you right now. I got to get this into my editor. So it was kind of years of, of pushing it away and staving it off, but I started practicing um, switching up my languaging and employing the languaging codes. And I had a tight knit group of friends, I call them my 5D soul family. And we were all playing with the languaging codes together and just acting as reflections for one another when we would hear each other using disempowered languaging. And I saw my life shift and my friends' lives shift, shift extremely rapidly and notably. And so, you know, years of playing with this myself, I started putting out videos and doing workshops. I was invited to write a book. And then finally, really only a few, I would say maybe three or four years ago, I finally surrendered. I was like, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to bring these, you know, this work, this transformational language into our planet and gift it to the world. So um, that's how I got to be a word witch. <laughs> okay, very good. That's a good start. Let's backtrack a little bit uh, further in here uh, to your childhood. Were you at that point as a young person also fascinated with words? Did your parents notice maybe that you were early speaking or late speaking or had trouble communicating with uh, with the world around you? How, how did that uh, fit in here to the story? Um, I always had a fascination with words and I was, all, I mean, I was definitely a bizarre, I always wanted to be by myself. I always wanted to be meditating. Like I was, I just w was very into my own internal wor world. Um, I was pretty advanced with language and started writing stories early on. So I was always, I knew I wanted to be a writer from the get go. Like that was kind of always there. And I always had a love of language. That was, that was, there was a through line there for sure. Okay. And I'm going to catch you maybe on a Freudian slip. At one moment there, you said there was a significant ship as opposed to shift. So have you been on board a ship? Where are you coming with, uh, with that one? 
Um, well, <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of, though. I mean, given that we all exist multidimensionally, I'm sure I'm on a ship now. <laughs> <laughs> Who even it's knows a, what planet hear? we're on, really? Go ahead, Seriously. Matthew. <laughs> It's an interesting question that you asked about the lang the languaging because as a as a writer, my first language was French, like you, Jean Claude. But I also was very I spoke a lot when I was I would be playing with my Barbie dolls and I'd pick up the phone and so it's an interesting question to ask Danny if from from the get go she was talking a lot. I mean, did your parents encourage you? Uh, well, them? I was a competitive gymnast, so that really marked my childhood. From from five to fifteen, I was training for the Olympics, so I was mostly encouraged to be a like an athletic champion. Um, but I was, I mean, I was a nerd. I was like a straight A student, and I just, yeah, I really, I I think what struck me most there was like being a writer and telling stories, and I was always entranced with the language, you know, like with how we could play with words. And you know, right now I'm reading Stephen Jenkinson's Die Wise. I don't know if you guys have read him, but he's what he's definitely a wordsmith where like words can just sort of like jostle us and make us feel so much. You know, the first, I think it was uh, in high school, we were reading Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And I was just struck by how much emotion the words could cultivate in me, you know, and how like I could read a sentence and start crying. And so there was something just about the power of words to evoke so much mm. that sucked me in. It, you know, it's funny. Uh, we're talking about our childhood and our understanding and maybe lack of vocabulary at the time. I remember being young, wanting to express so many things and being frustrated all the times that I didn't have the words to express them. And not that um, I didn't have a good vocabulary in French, of course, it was my native tongue, but I always felt that there were other words that either had not yet been invented or were not part of our lexicon, or perhaps were part of my lexicon before I dropped into this particular planet right. we're on. And I remember being frustrated for a long time. So I'm, I'm excited to, to have this conversation. <laughs> tonight. Okay, folks, thank you so much for joining us here on this live interactive show. I do apologize for being a little bit late. We had a few technical issues here just before we started the show. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, waiting patiently in the chat. And of course, we'll take your comments and uh, during the show. And perhaps if we have time at the later end, we'll also have some question uh, time for you guys as well. Okay, Mariam, where do you want to start with this? There's so many places we want to go. Uh, Danny here is a very, like you, a very multifaceted uh, <laughs> feminine. There's so many things we could talk about. We could probably do a four hour show, <laughs> uh, but let's focus maybe on this first book. Maybe also talk about the upcoming book. I'd and like to talk about how we know each other. Yes, well actually let's start there uh, for the audience. I think that's always very interesting how you bring all these amazing characters uh, to life yeah. here. I have so many more folks, so many more in my repertoire. And and it was last week I was like, oh, who? And I'm like, oh my God, why? How? Because I've wanted to be, wanted to interview Danny on other things, uncensored things. But then I thought, wow, this is perfect for the quantum woo. And uh, given that Danny is also a journalist and we were both living in Los Angeles and I haven't seen her in the physical, as she reminded me, in two years because she left before me, uh, Los Angeles, but we were literally neighbors. And so, Danny, I don't remember when we first met, but certainly we were in the same circles. And do you know, do you recall? I'm sorry. I do. Yeah. I do. So I had heard of you before I met you because we're so similar. It's, you know, like, Miriam and I both wrote for the LA Weekly. We're both super fi. We were both we were both really attuned to the health and wellness scene. So and um, Jay Levin was a mutual friend. So I'd heard about Miriam, and then it was at some sort of um, like health expo. You were working the counter for I forget his name, but he was bald. Maybe Essential Living Foods. Yeah, possibly. Like Paul and chlorella tablets. There was like a festival outside, and I finally met you. Um, and then we ended up living ne literally next door to one another 
which was a godsend because that was when we were both like the censorship started and we would, you know, we were both kind of hitting up against the same walls and take our walks and get it all out. <laughs> I want to say something to that, that so Beachwood is a magical neighborhood and I had my eyes set on that hood, but I would just kind of cross the back alley and then go and see Danny and we would go on these magical walks in Beachwood and Beachwood has some secret stairs and we both lived there for a long time and we'd have these like power walks and we talk journalism and we talk, I was going to say 1984 and we would often get lost and we would find ourselves and be like, we live here right. and it's just something so mad. Like, I'm like, have you been here before? No. <laughs> and there was something really magical and just so beautiful to have someone who's as sensitive as me. And uh, we were living across the street of a Z Cinco Geo pole and we were both experiencing the energetics of that. But some having someone that can likes to play with words, and we were watching, we were watching our careers or our our status in the mainstream go down the toilet, and to be able to be on the same page with someone who's as sensitive, and I think very much mirrors to one another. And Danny has been a teacher to me because I really do believe there's so much weight and magic in words. And I've wanted and been conscious of getting out of this victim stance that I encourage everybody to do. And so I, maybe one of the last times was I went to a workshop in that Danny was giving downtown and then she left to New Mexico and then I left to SF and then Costa Rica. And like she mentioned, Jay Levin, who started LA Weekly, and I've taken his courses. I've taken, maybe you have two, Conscious Loving, which I highly, highly recommend as a book, and also learning nonviolent communication that narcissists know nothing about. So yeah, I'm I'm just really great grateful for for Danny um as we've gone through this uh regime to not have lost her as a friend. Yeah, and we've lost so many friends <laughs> during the last year. Every one of us, and especially the people watching the show, um we, we have this conversation once in a while and we all realize that we had to mourn a lot of those friendships, not just the friendships, but also what we thought was reality. Uh, we're mourning the fact that a lot of it was completely fake. And so we're moving into this new world. And it's funny, uh, Danny, when you started, you said you were a Aquarius baby. And of course, we are moving into the age of Aquarius. So it's quite fitting <laughs> that you brought that up. Speak about that a little bit here. Your, uh, how do you maybe download non-local information? We'll get into the quantum languaging here a little bit, but it seems to me just listening to the way you speak and the way you compose yourself that you have a broad uh, band antenna of way of how you um, accumulate data and thoughts and ideas. Do, do you have an ex um, do you have words to put to that on how that is and how you connect to non-local information for the audience? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so in the human design, are you guys familiar with the human design? Yes. So in human design, my crown chakra is wide open. So it is, I'm constantly downloading information. And actually for me, um, there's more effort going into putting boundaries up and just claiming my space for myself. So it, it's constant and it can be quite overwhelming. Um, just in terms of all the information coming in and then all that, um, you know, that, that like wants to be done with that information. And, and I'm like, I'm just one little person. <laughs> I'm, do, I'm doing as much as I can, you know? So a lot of times it's me like putting a stop on it so that I can finish other projects because it, it's kind of, um, Oh, it's constant. <laughs> yeah, and it's always at the most inopportune time. I've noticed also in my life, it start, I, I had this as a kid. It was very loud. I had voices and visions and downloads and all this stuff. And I kind of put it away because it wasn't popular, you know, and it all came back in around 2008 or nine. And at that point, the voices were so loud that like you, 
I was seeking people to help me and to give me tools on how to bring the volume down because I needed to <laughs> be able to function in life. Exactly. And then I, I, right, yeah. right, right. So that's fascinating. And I'm sure a lot of the audience members feel the same way too. There's a lot of these same uh, star seeds or wanderers, whatever you want to call them. We're all kind of kind of blinking at this time and there's a reason for that. I'm really excited for this talk. Okay, um, Mariam, let's go back to some of your notes here for the interview. Where do you want to shift uh, gears to next here? Well, I want Danny to share some of the principles and in, in, in that that I learned in the workshop, and just you know, words are powerful, and they're incantations, and they they can be spells, and we have to be responsible with what we utter. So, I'd I'd, I'd like for for Danny to to share some tidbits. I think maybe focusing on getting out of this victim stance and realizing really the power of words. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, what I've learned from experience is that, and we all know this to a certain extent, but the subconscious mind is, is responsible for 95% of our reality. It's how we make meaning of information. It's how we filter information and the subconscious mind is programmed through language. So that's every single word that we say, that we think, that we receive is programming us. And, you know, I've seen in my lifetime this like massive distortion overtake the populace that there's value in victimhood. And we've seen, you know, it, it's really amped up in the past decade of people fighting for most oppressed status. Um, which really doesn't translate into a life well lived. All it does is give us an excuse to live small, unactualized lives and collect pity. But pity doesn't translate to like fun or abundance or connection or success, right? And, and I see this as an op that the social engineers have foisted upon us. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us have taken the bait. So, um, the flip side of that is that empowerment is kind of like kryptonite to all of the, am I allowed to swear on the show? You can swear all the way. Okay, great. To all the fuckery that we're enduring. Um, I, I see empowerment as the thing that makes us um, immovable and not controllable, which is why our society goes the distance to disempower us and to have us speaking language where we're disempowering ourselves. And so that's really the trick of language is because we're speaking it and thinking it and texting it all day, every day, we're enslaving ourselves. And so many people are looking outside for these fixes where it's really simple. It's like, how are we speaking about our lives? How are we telling our own stories? How are we describing our realities? And I've learned this through my own experience because I, you know, when I wrote for the LA Weekly, um, I kind of made a niche for myself of like, all these terrible things happened to me and isn't this funny or isn't this amazing? And I ended up painting myself into a corner for my byline where like once I caught on to this kind of um, narrative trick that I was using, I realized that I was stuck in a victim mindset and that my life sucked. <laughs> and the only way to get myself out of it was to start using different language and to tell myself different stories. And I watched myself shift my life so drastically and I've seen it around me. And we just don't realize how insidious weaponized language is and how insidious these like little toxic tricks are that have us playing small and you know keeping ourselves from really being empowered reality creators and you know you go back to the bible and i'm not a bible-y person i've actually never read it but there is that one kind of precept um in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and that is so powerful the word was God. And that is the reality creation technology that we've been given. And, you know, so many of us fret about the state of the world and what's going on. And I see evolution, you know, like sustainable, beautiful, new paradigm, new earth evolution being simple and graceful when we shift the languaging. 
you know, because as we're speaking equality, as we're speaking empowerment, as we're speaking abundance, as we're speaking inclusivity, as we're speaking solutions, then the reality that emerges from that language will necessarily reflect all of those qualities. It can't not. And at the same time, as we're trying to solve issues with a toxic hierarchical language of disempowerment, no change will come from that language. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter how beautiful the ideas are. If we're speaking them with slave languaging, then that is not going to shift the culture. So I, I, I see ling language as the most powerful technology on the planet, and I'm excited for us to clue into it and start utilizing it um, in a way that serves us and serves all of us. I want to wanna... on that. Mm -hmm. So let's... So let's... Um, I'm going to bring your volume down just a little bit. We're getting an echo back from you. I'll mute myself. Is this better? Hello, hello? Okay, so let's say, Danny, there is victimization. So I've catched myself in this. And so recently I lost, I lost my Twitter and I've been licking my wounds and I've been feeling sorry for myself and I've been sad. So I'm painting myself as a victim because I am being victimized, but it's not, it's not like I'm just going to lay down and go, okay, um, I'm giving up, but at the same time. And then on top of that, I have someone who's arguably narcissistic, who's telling me you're painting yourself as a victim and you're talking about yourself and like is on top of on top of what I may be doing wrong, for lack of a better word, is on top of that shitting on me. So how do you, how does one unravel from that? Because there is victimization going on, but yet not paint themselves as a victim. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. So the, the two pieces that are sticking out, and I'm going to come back to my main, to my main point um, in a second, is you, you said, uh, that you've been sh shitting on something someone has someone has like i lacerate myself and and i i want to be the best version of myself and use this life wisely and yet I, I so i've been painting myself of a victim or like woe is me in regards to twitter specifically uh, because it really hurt the most because I've lost intellectual property. And then on top of that, I have someone who's like, you're hijacking conversation. Uh, it's it's low level to be talking about yourself. And then instead of coming in a loving way, let's say like you would as a coach and say, this is not empowering you or you can make some of these small shifts is further, I'm feeling like crap because I'm an empath and I'm swallowing it. So how do I, un, how do we, how does one get out of that when they've made a mistake or they catch themselves and they've, and they've talked to a whole bunch of people and maybe painted themselves as a victim because they've truly been victimized. Okay. That Great question. Sense? It does totally it make sense? makes sense. So I don't believe that there are any victims ever, ever. And I'm a big fan of the book, Right Use of Will. Have you guys read the book, Right Use of Will? No, but I'm writing it down. It's a, oh good, yay. It's one of those must reads. I mean, I'm all for free will and I'm never gonna tell anyone what to do. And I'm also excited for the whole planet to read this book. Um, so this book is channeled from source directly, not like an intermediary or, or an, an angel or whatnot. And God also says in this book, there are no victims. We are all co-creators of our reality. And it's only from the standpoint of taking 100% responsibility for our reality that we are empowered to transform and create reality. If it's 99%, it's not gonna cut it. It's only when we take 100% responsibility. So we're all co-creating our every experience. And in every experience, you know, the way to get out of victimhood is, so it's it's a few things. One, there's the languaging pattern, and this is what I was pointing to. Yes, that is absolutely the book. Um, is So there's a languaging pattern. Um, victims are never the subject of the sentence, right? It's like something happened to me. Like someone fucked me over. He abandoned me. She, you know, hurt my feelings, right? We're all, victims are the, 
are always people to whom something is happening to. And I also wanna be clear because no one's a victim, people who are running victim consciousness, because we are all empowered beings, it's just when are we gonna claim it? So in any instance, it's looking at where can I take responsibility? You know, like I was deplatformed from Tumblr, I lost my, you know, YouTube videos. And finally, like with YouTube, for I, it got to the point where after two strikes, I was like, this is an abusive relationship. <laughs> and either I'm going to take my power back and take all my videos off, or I'm going to continue to be abused and waste all my therapy sessions railing against YouTube. Right. You know, so it's looking at when we're in relation, where we're choosing to be in relationship with abusers, it's on us to look at why am I signing on to this relationship? Why am I letting someone speak to me this way? Why am I having a friendship with someone who's berating me for how I communicate or X, Y, Z? And then it's just, and then that's where it gets to be really tender, right? And where we really need to show ourselves love to look at those aspects of ourselves that think we don't deserve love. We don't deserve, you know, to be able to speak freely. That we think we need to sign on to being censored or to playing these games and everything that we're seeing in the world now. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, I understand the, uh, the parameters here, but everything we're seeing in the world now is because we're dealing with people who think that they don't deserve absolute freedom, who think that we need to compromise this way, which we don't. And it's only because so many of us are playing along with it. Like, Oh, I need to do X, Y, Z, you know, I need to do this thing to get here. And when all of us say, no, I don't live a conditional life. I do what I want to do. Then none of this would be happening, you know, but we all place these conditions on ourselves and we all do it because we all have trauma, you know, and it's just a matter of, of looking at where we're lang languaging ourselves as victims. And then, so like basic kindergarten is anytime we hear ourselves languaging ourselves as victims, like, um, Twitter deplatformed me. It's like, okay, so how do we relanguage that in such a way that I'm the subject of this sentence? You know, like, um, and it's hard with it's it's hard with actual injustices. There's injustice, but then there's also like victimization, and victimization is like we're trying to play the game with them. Like, if I want to be in bed with Jack Dorsey then I know it's going to be an abusive relationship right, right. that requires me to sell myself to the devil. You know, like we know that it's, that it's a, a, a messed up game and it's just taking responsibility for how we're playing it. You know, I, I love it, Danny. Just tell us what it. you really mean. I don't, don't it. hold back. <laughs> I keep going. I just thought I put some levity in there. There's a few people who are ticked off by the conversation because we're touching core wounds. Uh, so really? maybe we can well, start how there. How are they ticked off? Maryam, maybe we can start there because this whole idea of using the correct syntax of success starts with ourselves, right? Deep down, because you can work on everybody else around you and all the narcissists, but if you haven't figured out your own core wound and how to deal with it and use that syntax of success to propel you out of that, you're not going to go anywhere fixing anybody on the outside. So maybe speak about that a little bit here, Danny. Yeah. I mean, life is not fair and life is brutal and terrible things happen to everyone. And the gist is if I'm going to language myself as a victim or position myself as a victim, when terrible things happen, then that has me living a disempowered victim life. There's no such thing as an empowered victim. It's one or the other, either we're empowered or we're a victim. And for me, I'm, and look, everyone has their own priorities, you know, and there's no, there's no wrong answer. For me, my priorities are fun and expansion and having a positive impact. So that requires me to heal victim tendencies and root myself in empowerment. So, um, you know, we talk about the, the quantum field or the morphogenetic field. And the morphogenetic field is made up of frequency bands. And there's a frequency band for every emotion, every energetic, every experience we could possibly have. So anytime I'm speaking victimhood and I'm languaging myself as a victim, I am attuning my frequency to the larger frequency bands of victimhood in the collective field and to disempowerment. And those frequency bands tell reality how to configure. So every time I language myself as a victim, I am telling reality, please continue 
to give me a reality construct that is going to victimize me and disempower me. The only way that we change the future is by making changes now. And that means relanguaging our experience in such a way that it attunes us to the frequency bands of the life that we want to be living. So there is like this uncomfortable um, kind of liminal space when we're first stepping out of victim consciousness where we're languaging ourselves um, into empowerment, but it doesn't necessarily feel organic, right? But it's in that place of discomfort, that's where we grow. That's where we transform. So it's like, we also get really comfortable because we have these neural networks in our brain of like victimhood, victimhood, victimhood. And it's very easy to go there and we're used to that. And so it's scary and it's hard to language ourselves as empowered reality creators because we're not used to it. But that's where the magic happens when we're brave and we use, you know, we language ourselves out of it and into a new reality by just changing our stories. And only we can do that. You know, a lot of us wait for external reality to shift to give us a different life. It really doesn't work like that. We change our own internal vibration and we do that with the words that we use. And that changes the frequency bands that we're connecting to. And only then does reality change for us. So, I, you know I'm, what's fascinating? Dr. Richard Allen Miller was on the show a couple of months ago, and he's deep into the occult. He studied quite a few things. And uh, he said to me, so, you know, JC, humans will be free uh, when man becomes responsible for the thoughts and words he entertains. <laughs> right? And that speaks to exactly what you're getting at here. And I love uh, Beth on the, on the screen here. She says, yeah, I appreciate all triggers because they're opportunities to heal. Yes, that's okay. that's the frequency of the show. <laughs> so thank you, Beth. I really appreciate that. Exactly. Keep going, Beth. Exactly. Like if we're not triggered, we don't know what needs healing. And it's something I realize in my path, like I trigger the shit out of people. And of course, there's a part of me that like, you know, that doesn't feel great. But I, at this point in my life, it's happened enough times, like I get it. And I'm happy to be of service just so people can know themselves as empowered and live the lives that they came here to create for themselves. Well, if they listen, right, if they actually tune in, and that's why I'm such a big proponent of self-awareness and know thyself and take responsibility. If, if you notice that like I'm teary while you're talking, it's because I I'm upset with myself because I've been having a pity party and I'm going back in my head at this conference and I'm like, fuck, I just, did I just screw up because I painted myself as this victim? Um, and how, how can I, reconcile that I slipped into it again because by this time I'm by by now I'm a pro at being banned and you're absolutely right you're choosing to engage in these abusive relationships what the fuck do you expect yeah so so if you make a mistake whoever's out there that is like oops I did it again I just went back into victimhood and you've caused damage is it how is it possible to immediately can you reconcile the 100%. damage that you've done? Okay, how? 100%. And so this is a perfect example is look at how in this moment, and thank you for being, you know, the example, you're choosing to write the story if you made a mistake. I don't see you as making a mistake. We're all learning. And, and this is how we learn is we titrate back. We have these moments of like, oh, I was, you know, I was, I slipped into victim languaging right and it, this is how we learn it's not a lot of people think transformation is like this linear straightforward thing but anyone who's really walked the, the transformational path it's so much more brutal it's you know two steps forward five steps back a face right. plant another humiliation you know it's all par for the transformational journey so i don't see it as making a mistake i see it as you you know having the experience you need as you continue to learn and grow and anyone who bore witness to this is part of your medicine. You know, they're, they're reflections for you. And it's all like, we're all always on the transformational path. Like that doesn't stop. So it's, it's just part of the journey. Um, so I would encourage anyone, it's not, we don't make mistakes. You know, we have learning lessons and we have growth experiences and sometimes they're mortifying and that's totally okay because we all do it. Oh, very good story. I muted That's myself beautiful. because we keep getting some little echoes and we have a delay between Mariam and I. I don't mean to speak over Mariam. So Mariam, go ahead. 
Oh, just just saying thank you. I'm I'm I feel you know you're saying that, and yes, it is all medicine. But I feel like because of my little pity party that I painted myself to. I mean, we're talking like I was hanging out with like Jack Posobiec and Dr. Muhammad Ali's wife, and I'm like, fuck. I was with these like notables, and I'm painting myself as like, woe is me. So I have caused damage where I've possibly blown opportunities and then have someone that I'm involved with that instead of like how you're saying it, like, it's okay, love, you know, this is the way you learn. And uh, it's more like, oh, well, you're not worthy to even be loved because it's not attractive that you're coming across as a victim. And I'm sorry, I'm just using myself as an example to highlight your knowledge. So I'm, I'm sure there's someone out there who can relate or, or is on a spiritual path. And like you said, has taken a, a couple of steps back. So I think, I mean, and I know you so well, Miriam is, and you and I both have this in common. We ha have historically been very hard on ourselves. Right. So like, you know, and looking back exactly. And it's like, you're so multidimensional. So where you're focusing maybe on pity party or these, these aspects of larger conversations, you have no idea what these people were really tapping into with you and what stood out to them in the grand scheme of the larger conversation, you know, also because, you know, those of us on a transracial path like this, we can really focus in on like where we fucked up and where we do better. And we're not noticing like, where you blew them away with, you know, this information or this piece and who knows what they needed to hear from you, you know, like it, cause also it's not all about you. So maybe there was something that you said to these people that they needed to hear, they needed to see. And I also think a lot of us, and I, I can only speak for myself, but this is something that I see from you in our friendship is, I mean, I have blown, I've made so many horrible first impressions and I have blown so many amazing connections, you know, by being volatile, by, you know, not being delicate with my speech, whatever it is. And I feel like I model transformation for people. So people who stick with us in the long haul, there's a lot of permission, I think, in seeing intelligent, well-meaning people fuck up, right? Or, or have learned lessons in public and, and witness our growth. And I think that that is a tremendous service to humanity because so many talking heads or public people that we see, it's only like this like sheen of perfection and you know everything's so polished and there's something to seeing people you know mess up and improve and and well real and, and raw and downs. yeah real and raw and vulnerable and um not you know all, all this like you said this sheer of bullshit it's just a mask on top of other masks well, I have so, to say, Mariam is the bravest woman I know, and she's the most authentic person I know. And this is why we had a series called The Raw Naked Truth. Uh, yet we got in trouble for that on YouTube here because, of course, we were too truthful and too raw. But thank you, Mariam, uh, for being in my life and sharing all of this with the audience you. because uh, you are a catalyst for change for so many of us. And uh, my heart goes out to you, Mariam. Um, as we move forward here, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned earlier, um, empowerment, abundance, and this idea that there's this pervasiveness of programming that puts us into this scarcity mode where humans are always fighting against each other for this perceived scarcity where in fact on this planet we have abundance. How, Danny, do we start reprogramming people? Last year, I started having a, a series called Kundalini Secrets Revealed. And again, in a lot of these uh, mystery school, they teach about disconnecting from this energy extraction matrix. That's priority number one. And two, to generate more of that energy so that you can apply it to your creations. Now, of course, this is also a banned subject here and I got in trouble for that on YouTube too and I can learn my lesson. And so we, we, we change our strategies. But what can we say from the spoken word frequency here to empower ourselves and detach from that um, 
energy extraction matrix and to start maybe building the momentum of creating and harnessing from the 10 tn more and more energy and then to apply it to our own creations as opposed to being automatons creating the prison of our own demise by the programs that are still affecting us maybe in some cases unbeknownst to us still yeah great such a great question um I recently, <laughs> i've been volunteering on a farm for the past several months and it is teaching me so much about the fundamental nature of abundance on this planet and just how everything else that that alleges that that there's not free flowing abundance here is a total lie and scam. So um, the book that I'm writing now, one of the fundamental issues that I see plaguing our culture, a lot of people like to pin it on patriarchy, which is insane. It's hierarchy. So hierarchy has us believing that there have to be winners or losers for there to be winners. There has to be a marginalized underclass for other people to succeed. You cannot have hierarchy and not have people getting short shrift. And our language is embedded with um, false hierarchy. Because of course there's natural hierarchy in the world. You know, some people are faster runners. Some people are more quick witted, like that. that's natural. But false hierarchy plagues our entire language. And hierarchy is dependent on the frequencies of lack limitation, separation, fear, conflict, fixity, fragmentation, all these things. So <clears throat> lack has been artificially embedded in the language. So there are things like, I mean, of course, the, the phrase, I can't afford it. There's, I, it, it's never true. It's so fundamentally disempowering um, to allege that lack. And, and then we victimize ourselves to the numbers in our bank account or the dollars in our wallet. But even take a phrase like, I don't have time. So right. if I say, you know, Miriam, if you invite me to, to meet you for lunch and I say, I don't have time, I'm alleging a lack of time. I'm alleging scarcity of time. So that statement, I don't have time, is going to connect me to the frequency band of lack in the quantum field and direct reality to configure to give me more lack. So in these subtle, insidious ways, we are speaking lack all day, every day. <clears throat> and not realizing that we are programming our reality to give us more lack. And to simply speak abundance, there's this great book um, by Jen Sincero called You Are a Badass at Making Money. And that book, she does a great job at just addressing the, the thought forms and the subconscious programs that have us thinking and speaking ourselves into a lack mentality. Things like, you know, EFT happy, um, tapping, with some yeah, affirmation, like, you know, like I'm paid well and often for being me. I, I love how easily money comes to me. These things create changes so fast to just affirm and also gratitude, you know, gratitude for what we have and how much abundance we really have. And it trains us to start looking for abundance. And that's a big thing that language does is it creates a lens of perception. So the language that we speak determines how we filter reality. When I'm speaking lack and I don't have enoughness, then that's how I look at everything. It's like a filter. You know, right. when, I'm, when I'm grateful for that I have 10 digits that work well, that I have eyesight that works all the time, that I have a refrigerator full of food, that I turn on the faucet and water comes out every time, that is amazing. So many right. people on the planet don't have that. Right. And Gratitude and attunement to the abundance that truly is there, you know, looking at all the leaves on a tree, a single tree, you know, really trains us it's to see alchemy. the alchemy. What was that? Gratitude is alchemy. Totally. It's alchemy. Mm -hmm. totally. It's alchemy to totally, like, regardless of all this traumatization that, that we're, we're experiencing, I just the Rona has cultivated so much more gratitude. Thank you, God, for this unmasked meal. Thank you for this walk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, it's not praying like Santa, like God is Santa. Like, you know, just giving gratitude. And it really is magic. How do you add, um, Danny, the power of the heart 
to the frequency of the words. Because when you just said gratitude there, I was uh, thinking of this medicine woman who was talking about how they do these uh, rain dances in the desert. And they had this crew there. And of course, she does her thing and blah, blah, blah. And they said, okay, so what did you do? What did you ask for? And she says, I didn't ask for anything. I just went into the gratitude for the water I had already received. And suddenly mm -hmm. universe responded. So she created that electromagnetic field to change the environment around her. So how do you combine, again, we could get into the Kundalini stuff and the Tantra stuff here, but just for this, the sake of this show here uh, and for the audience, how do you combine the magic of that electromagnetic pump that we have here in the middle of our chest with the frequency of these words? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I want to bring in another piece that you just mentioned was that the, the woman that you were referencing, she was in a place of already having. Right. Right. There was no space between the water she was calling in yeah. and the water that she was grateful for in the present moment. So it's twofold. It's um, not buying into the illusion of linear time and collapsing that illusion with present moment languaging and present moment gratitude. And for me, the way that I tap into that, because it's, it's yes, we need to generate that feeling state, is um, I, I sing to myself quite a bit. So I sing all my affirmations and I'll like kind of dance and move them into <laughs> my body. Cause, Cause I think there's kind of like, um, there can be a cheese factor to affirmations, right? It can be cheesy and it can feel kind of silly. And, you know, I'm more of a, a rock and roll girl, you know? But when I sing it and I move it into my body, it becomes more real and it becomes more playful. And it's, um, it's not like this new age, like purple unicorn nonsense. Um, it just allows me to get it into my body. Body to be what do you mean? There's no purple and unicorns? digest it. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Maria. We Sorry, have a, a little delay. Moving, go ahead, Maria. Moving, because we're also both, Danny and I are both dancers to it. It allows you to embody oh. what you're, and, and bring it into the being and, and, and kind of implant itself, I think. So, and why not be cheesy? Yeah. And I also, I mean, yeah, why not be cheesy? I think it, they, we get to a point where it's like, fuck it, who cares? I'll be as cheesy as I want to. But, you know, like putting my hands on my heart and really, because a lot of times we can, you know, I'll just speak for myself in the past, rush through a bunch of affirmations all up in my head. But it's like pausing and to not leave the session until we get it in there, you know? Mm -hmm. There's so much power in what you just said there, getting into that, I don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks. Like that is such an impediment for a lot of people. Oh, well, what are they gonna think if I dance in the street? Or what do they think if I'm singing to myself? What do they think? Who cares? <laughs> are you happy? That's what counts. Oh man, so many people. Oh, anyways, I love that you said and, that. And also when, when, like I'm often like the first one on the dance floor, I don't give a fuck. I wanna dance and spirit is moving me. I am channeling. And then by being free, I see others come. And then they feel like, okay, yeah, let's do this. Because you've set it in motion and given them permission mm. to express themselves in whatever way, whatever setting we're talking about. Mm -hmm. to, to just, you know, they say dance like nobody's watching, but just being yourself as long as long as you're not harming anyone and you're you're conscious and I want to just say also like I can relate to Danny as yes I've witnessed her piss other people off <laughs> but I feel like there's some of us that are like I'm a mirror this is you're looking at yourself and I'm going to show you and I'm also versatile like you're versatile that you're bringing out something in someone else without necessarily even knowing what is going on by bringing that to the surface. Mm -hmm. Why is we, have amazing, we have amazing people in the chat here. You guys should read the <laughs> comments while we're doing this stuff live. Okay, I have this question for you. It's been bugging me for the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes here, Danny. What have you learned? Let me take this off the screen here so you can see me. Okay, what have you learned after writing this book from the response you had from viewers and readers of your book if you were to say here are the three main things 
either the reviews or people sending you emails or life transformation stories, what really hit you maybe as those three main things that changed your life and changed the way you even thought yourself um, as a mission oriented person writing this book? What have you learned? Um, first and foremost, that what I have to share is valuable, um, mm. which I didn't, you know, like, uh, self-esteem did not come naturally to me. So <laughs> just the fact that there was something valuable for other people in it was a huge game changer for me. Um, I think I get a lot of comments about the positivity and the encouragement. And I realize, um, how so many of us are starved for that you know, and don't have people cheering us on and telling us that we can change and we can be amazing and that we are amazing as we are. Um, and just how many people are tired of their own victim shit. You know, I think that's another thing, like that I thought I was the only one and realizing, no, there are a lot of us who had painted us ourselves into the victim corner and how, you know, it's just more fun for all of us to be empowered. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you find there's a commonality? Do you get a, a feedback, like some part in the book that people seem to resonate the most with? Like a pattern? Do you, do you, have you noticed a pattern in the feedback of something that's, that people have latched on? Um, I'm not – I think – I'm not noticing a pattern in the feedback from the book per se, but what I am noticing is the permission and the appreciation. I think there's a people appreciate um, that I can speak about mystical things and spiritual things and growth, but swear a lot and be <laughs> cheeky about it and be in your face. And I think that gives other badasses permission to be like, yeah, like I'm a loudmouth badass and I also am devoted, you know, to my own transformation and to spirit. And I think there's just a flavor that maybe um, people were missing. Right. I can definitely relate to that. Well, that's yeah, refreshing. Definitely. I love it. Yeah, I, love <laughs> I love this it. conversation so far. It's, a, it's been amazing. And I could just imagine uh, getting into all of these other topics with you because you keep uh, something keeps screaming at me that you're presenting way more. Um, than you're actually presenting. So I, I'm, I'm lost for words here, of course. I'm thinking in French. No, but I think that's there. very <laughs> accurate what you're saying because there's a lot there to read between the lines. Yeah. Let, let's let's help out a, little, a few hacks. Like people say all the time, I don't have time, rather than I choose to do something else. Exactly. Um, or, yeah, I choose to do something. I Let's say someone says, I need to do this. Um. How, yeah. how, what are a couple of little hacks that people use every single day without even really being cognizant that mm -hmm. can make a difference? Um, so the biggest thing that I see is um, living a life of choice versus a life of have to. So in the workshops that I do, um, I will invite people to make a list of all their have to's and then relanguage everything as choice. I choose to do this. And a lot of times what that involves is taking things out a few steps. You know, like I work with a lot of parents who will victimize themselves to parenthood and their parenting tasks. And it's like, well, let's jump ahead. Like why you chose to have children, to build your legacy, to contribute amazing humans to the world. So framing all of the tasks as a choice that you're doing in service to the larger why. You know, so I invite people to look at any have to, anything they're claiming as a need and really reclaim it as choice because it is so much more empowering. So a lot of what's going on right now with the restrictions that we're dealing with, people are feeling disempowered. And I'll hear a lot of like, I'm not allowed to do X or they won't let me do X. So in that sense, I tell people, you know, language, whoever's rule it is, it's their rule. They're the subject of the sentence. It's their rule. So, oh, they, <clears throat> their policy is X. I'm not feeling aligned with it, so I'm going to do Y, right? So it's like the policy is theirs. We don't link it. It's not I'm not allowed to. I, I don't want to get us banned or anything. So let's say it's um, 
I'm not allowed to eat pancakes. It's like, well, they have a, you know, a pancake mandate and I'm not feeling aligned with eating pancakes today. So I'm going to go somewhere else. Right. So it's separating ourselves because, because there are these quantum entanglements, right? So when we Fuck link the ourselves. Pancakes. <laughs> I identify with pineapples, actually, but keep going. <laughs> but when we link ourselves with these various mandate, mandates, you know, I'm not allowed to or I can't, we create these these quantum entanglements between ourselves and the restrictions, and then we get pissed, and then we feel enslaved, and we feel like we're not free, versus languaging it in the impersonal, this is their rule, I'm choosing to abide by it or I'm not. Mm -hmm. You know, and so then even if I do choose, it's my choice and I'm still the empowered person who's not restricting myself because we don't have to, you know, we do have choice. We can, we don't have to do these things. Granted, there are, there are um, implications to those choices, but when we language our choices as choices, we get to stay empowered versus they won't let me, I'm not allowed to, then we're in victim conscious and those are the frequency bands that we're tuning and that's how reality is going to configure. So to create distance between ourselves and the rules that others are attempting to impose. Yeah, very good. Let, let's say I have another question. Let's say... Hey, hold on, Mariam, hold on just a second here. We're at the 55 minute mark. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll ask the audience if you have any questions for Danny, please now uh, start populating that in the chats. Please put them in high caps so it's easier for me to pick up. And while I wait for you guys uh, to populate the chat with questions, back to Mariam. Go ahead, Mariam. So I was reading, we'll get to someone asked about our HAP B. Um, we, <laughs> we can get that later so what what do you do maybe this sounds like an it's obvious answer if you're interacting with someone who is painting themselves as a victim or is using languaging and not acknowledging or realizing the uh, the power in words and are using them as weapons and you happen out there to be an empath where you feel these slings and arrows because of the words or the lack of consciousness in their languaging. Like, you know, in nonviolent communication, you know, you, you instead of saying, you are this and you are that, you switch and you say, I'm feeling this yeah. way. And that in itself is empowering and is not violent where you're attacking someone. Mm -hmm. with the frequency of these negative words. So how do you deal, like, if you encounter someone who has... Does that make sense, what I'm asking? It does make sense. I mean, if it's a friend or someone I'm in relationship, then I'll ask, <clears throat> are you open to a, you know, to a languaging reflection? And if they are, I can offer something. If something isn't landing well with me, I'll say, yeah, I'm not... I'm not really aligned with this conversation or I'm not going to sign on to it. You know, if someone wants to project something onto me, I'll say, you know, I'm not going to sign on to that and I'll kind of relanguage it. Um, it's, I mean, it's also knowing your audience. Like if I'm not, if I don't have a relationship with someone and they're clearly in a state where they're not going to be receptive, I'll probably just remove myself, you know, or, you know, see as uh, how high of a road can I take here and just get myself out of it as quickly as possible. No, I mean, um, I mean, when, when you're interacting with someone that you know, that, that is not really mindful of the words that they're using and, and they're, they're hurtful or their own, they're negative. It's just negative. If you are lashing out and not taking responsibility and saying, I feel this way, it's basically an onslaught of negative shit at you, especially if you are an, an empath. I mean, obviously you'd probably say just not interact with that person. Yeah, I would remove my, I mean, I would remove myself from the conversation if, if it's, consistently violent and there's all this projection and then I would go inside to look at why am I choosing to be in this relationship and like what is it in me that is feeling attracted to this type of abuse this and again like for me I'm it's it's pointless to try to change the external world so for right. me it's like where can I take responsibility 
what part of me feels that it is okay to be abused like this? Like, how am I attract? Because it always takes two to tango. Right. Right. So it's like, what am I doing to attract this and what needs to be healed? And then once that's healed, generally the dynamic will fall away. Right. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time um, trying to change other people who aren't willing to take responsibility for themselves. Like that just doesn't work for me. No, life's too short. I agree. Can we yeah. show what was that? What was that funny quote from uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall when the waiter is asking the guy for, "Hey, did you listen to my mixtape?" And he says, "Yeah, I, I, I decided to carry on with my life." <laughs> anyway, something like that. <laughs> it was Russell Brand. He was hilarious. In that. Um, I just I wanted here, to I show some of your Danny's. Instagram for the audience uh, members here, and I see uh, Emily Moyer was there in one of your interviews. I think that's fascinating because there's somebody in the chat now asking about words and how that connects to emotions. And of course, somebody was just saying, yeah, Cliff High talks about that. And uh, Emily and Randy Mo uh, Mogens had had an interview with Cliff High a while back, and they were talking about time, but also how uh, he has this, uh, what he calls mom, model of model space, where he gives emotional values to specific words. And in his predictive linguistic models, this is key to understanding humanity as we were all leaking the psychicness and also reading into the future here. So the question from Tom, it's on the screen. Tom, where did you go? Tom was asking, here we go. Okay, Danny. Okay, thanks. Oh, no, Ben, Ben Thompson. Thank you. He says, speak, speak a little bit about the connection between words and emotions and manifesting. How does that all tie in for you? Daniel. Okay, cool. And I just want to I just want to speak to what you were just mentioning because I have a podcast with Emily Moyer and our most recent episode we were talking about how we both move a lot and gesticulate a lot and kind of um linking that to the to the information that we're bringing through and how it kind of it helps. Okay. So and for the audience members, they can find all of these podcasts here on Instagram, or is there another place also you want to direct? No, them to? so my words podcast is on Odyssey. Um, because okay. I like I said, I was I got tired of being censored and getting strikes on YouTube. So we moved everything to Odyssey. So Emily has hers on Rumble, but our all of our words episodes are on Odyssey. Um, okay, let me bring that up for the audience here as well. And I'll bring that link down to the live chat so you guys can uh, click on that. Also, and also I will to also add Danny. that uh, to the description box below of the video. So if you guys are watching this on repeat, all of Danny's and also Mariam's links are in the description box below here. Okay, Also, go ahead, Also to mention that Danny is also an illustrator. So can we show some of her, you don't call them cartoons. What do you call them? Illustrations? I Can call them go? chicken scratchy scribbles. <laughs> well, they're quite profound if we can oh, scroll down. Thank and you. Because Danny's made clothes and um, also has a calendar. Yeah, I have calendar. an illustrated coloring book. You can find all of that on my website, dannycats.com. There's a link to my shop. and But, but Danny, even, even the fact that when you're – you know, doing, you call it chicken scratch, but even the movement of, of drawing something is also helping birth that. So yeah, yeah. Look, at, look, look at, look how, look how awesome that is. Oh, I love this one. Obstacle my ass, Ganesha. <laughs> I want that, <laughs> I want I that like on a copy mug. That's amazing. Do you have a copy <laughs> mug like that? Obstacles my ass. Yeah. I have a, I do have a mug and I also have leggings and it says obstacles my ass on the butt. They're pretty freaking cute. <laughs> I want some of those because I yeah, love those will look great shot. on you. I want okay. some. All right, guys. Again, uh, the links are all in the description box below. Let's go back to uh, Ben's question. Yes, and how uh, uh, emotions tie into uh, words and also manifesting. Thank you, Ben, for the question. Yeah, it's a great question. I, when it comes to manifesting, the key is to be in the emotion of having already manifested the thing. So it's, you know, I talk to myself every morning. It's part of my, after I meditate and pray and do all the weird stuff that I do, I talk about the stuff that I'm manifesting as though it's already happened. And I generate that excitement that I feel because it has already happened. Um, and that's that's the, the secret sauce that brings it in is to, to be in that state. So if it's, you know, like Radiohead's one of my prime examples because that's like 
I, I, I have historically very consistently manifested tickets to every Radiohead concert. And um, anytime they would announce that they were coming to LA, I would just announce like, I'm going. And I would just remember how it felt to be so, I mean, that is just the highest of highs for me to be dancing and screaming at the top of my lungs along with Tom York. And so I'll just like remember <laughs> that and call that feeling into my body. And literally every time I put no effort into it at some, like they'll just drop in somehow. So it's it's that, and I think it's also that the um, the present moment declarative languaging. It's like I'm going to Radiohead, and it's it's already done. It's already happened. Um, yeah, combined absolutely. with whatever that feeling state is. Do you I think that? Do you think that at first you can fake it till you make it? Do you think that yes. like saying it even though the person may not believe it but still uttering those words as a as a spell incantation absolutely and that's you know there's a whole spectrum of how quantum languaging can be employed so it is absolutely a fake it till you make it because we have been indoctrinated to misunderstand time and it's it's been done on purpose look at our calendar system it's a shit show deck means 10 but december is not the 10th month you know, oct means eight, it's not the eighth month. We have 30 days, 31 days, 28, 29 some year. Like as a system of measurement, it's an atrocity. It makes no sense. And so we've all been duped into believing that time is this linear conveyor belt moving us past, present, future, and it isn't. So for us to language things in the present moment that haven't yet manifested is a total fake it till you make it because it, it's counterintuitive to everything that we've been taught. But that's also where the transformational mojo is. And you know, like Miriam, you're the perfect example. And this, you know, I've, I've had this experience too many times to count where we'll language an upgrade and like, you know, early days, like I deserve love, I, I would make me wanna cry. You know, like I couldn't say, it, it was beyond faking it till I made it. It just brought up all these emotions. And so a lot of times the languaging upgrade will point us to the wound, right? And that's the magic for those of us who are courageous enough to do the work is to, to use that as like, you know, in the same way we were describing me triggering people, it's like pointing our attention to something that's inviting integration. And then we go in and do the inner child work and, you know, whatever our practices around that is. And then we really get to heal in quantum leap. You know, it's funny. You just said um, something about mojo. And I'm like, crikey, I've lost my mojo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because it ties into the question on the screen. Graphic is asking, uh, Danny, do we actually need to verbalize our intentions or can we use the thought or mm -hmm. inner language? What's the mojo? What's the difference in levels of mojo by actually verbalizing and creating those uh, frequency waves out into the open as opposed to saying it internally? I'm, uh, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but I'm a believer in overkill. <laughs> so um, I feel like if we think it, like, of course, there's definitely benefits. We want to change our thoughts, right? And noticing the thoughts that we loop on and rewriting them. But when we aspirate things, we feel the vibration in our mouth. It moves through our whole body. And, you know, for me in the work that I do with language, I can only hear the distortions in the language when, when I say them in my own mouth and feel them resonating through my own body. And I can feel when they, they don't move, there's not a flow to them. And I, and I would also say there's major power to writing, handwriting and writing with a non-dominant hand. You know, right. like for me, I get it from every angle um, because that's just how I roll. And if someone's intuition is telling them something different, these aren't hard and fast yeah. rules. You know, like everyone has their own way. Do you think, do you think, uh, have you ever found yourself having conversations with someone like today? I, I yelled yeah. by myself in the, I had a conversation to just get it out. Do you find, have you ever done that? Is there, do you find benefit in that? I definitely do because, because, um, because we're expressive beings, you know, like if we're holding resentment, that resentment needs to move, but we don't necessarily 
want to destroy the relationship by saying it to some of them. So I, yes, I do, you know, I'll have conversations by myself to move the energy or write, write letters or emails that never get sent. Right. That's um, a big one. That's a very useful. Yeah. Because energy likes to move. And I think, I think it's another fundamental misunderstanding of the whole like healing or transformational journey where like we might just stop doing something. I see it a lot with addiction. It's like, okay, you stop doing the thing you're addicted to, but that energy still needs yeah. to move. It needs an outlet. So if we don't give it an outlet, it's going to back up on us and, you know, cause any number of, of disasters, disease, disharmony, what have you. As a stepping stone for the movement, Danny, and in your understanding and practice of Tantra, speak about breath work and how that is yet very simple, very easy, but most people don't actually think about it in terms of creating that initial movement in that flow. Talk about that a little bit for the audience. I mean, breath is super, it's just so powerful. Um, it's this thing that our body does of its own accord. But when we take, you know, what what takes care of ourself and we bring consciousness to it and we decide to steer it, there's so much magic in that. And I think, I mean, I'm not, I don't know the science of the power of breath per se, but um you know, there are different breathing exercises I've done, even just, you know, alternate nostril breathing to calm the vagus nerve, to, to sink the hemispheres or breath of fire, or just as someone who, you know, Miriam and I definitely have this in common, there's a lot of fire. <laughs> so when there's a lot of fire, you know, it's like just slow, deep breathing will reconnect me to myself because otherwise I can go way out into the emotional sphere and, and kind of lose myself. But the breath will bring me back and I can see it, you know, when I'm working with clients in a tantric space of like how, how much the breath can anchor, how we can move energy through the body with breath and how, um, I mean there, and then there are just so many different breath practices that do amazing, you know, take us into psychedelic spaces or I, I mean the, the breath project practice is amazing. Um, in terms of being able to shift our state of consciousness um, and just state control in general. Yeah. What, what's your moon, Danny? You're a double Aquarius? Um, I'm Aquarius, Sun, Aquarius, North Node. I'm Aries, Moon, Mars, Rising, Chiron. What's your rising? Aries. Wow. So Aries, Moon, Aries, Rising? Yes. You're <laughs> like. <laughs> I got very that. personal very fast Damn. in my job. <laughs> Damn, girl. <laughs> oh, my God. Guys, we're already an hour and 15 minutes into this. Okay, let Can me do this. Can we talk about I this? Yes, let's talk about that. And then I'll ask uh, Danny how we can connect with her, support her work. I'll ask her about her next book. And I'll give the last words of wisdom uh, to Matthew here before we end the show. So let's get into this uh, party frequency that we're all in, so, even though I'm kind of living um, vicariously through you guys right now. So one, I didn't know that Danny had a happy. And I was just at the Bulletproof conference in Orlando and looking for new companies to affiliate with. And my girlfriend, Brianne, that was with me, well, of course, there's the bee, and I'm the bee lady. But this is supposed to create, and you'll add to this, Danny, a magnetic field. So you go, there's an app on the phone, and I picked Happy Hour, which is embodying, <clears throat> I think, the frequency in this respect of nicotine, actually I, I think so but there's there's focus there's deep sleep which i i have to to work on you could put it on airplane mode so the idea is like i think some people can put it as a as a halo they um, have to have really big heads yeah there's some big heads out there but so it's creating a magnetic field and i'm still playing with it to see i definitely like it on but i'm still feeling it out so what's your what's your experience danny i'm the same so i heard luke story's podcast oh, about it okay um and he's you know he is he's kind of a snob and he was raving and it was when i was giving up cannabis and caffeine at the same time so i thought oh like what a cool way 
to sort of alter my consciousness, but not deal with, you know, the things that I was relinquishing or any of the downsides that come along with them. And I've also, I've never tried a cigarette in my life, but I've heard that nicotine is an amazing tropic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. So that, I, that was Luke, appeal. Luke was Luke was at the at the bulletproof conference, but I don't know if you've made amends with him. But I I totally ignored him. Because I didn't have was, anything to make amends with him over. Oh, I thought you wanted to be on his program as well, and he didn't have enough badass women on the show. Well, when I was writing Durek's book, Durek said Luke's looking for women to have on the show. I'm going to put you in touch. And then when I followed up with Luke, he was like, oh, I'm booked out for a year and a half. And I just was like, okay, whatever. Yeah, and I, I reached out to him and I was like, I'd like to do a program on health censorship. And he kind of blew me off. And then I saw him in LA and then he started getting censorship. And I, I sent out a snide. I'm like, now do you give a shit about censorship? And he like, anyway. All right. So that, what, was, so, what was that thing in Germany? Oh, I didn't say anything when they came after my neighbors. And then when they came after me, there was nobody else to help me. That thing. <laughs> right. That thing. That thing. Exactly. Yeah. Karma's but everyone bitch, else is like, la, 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 la. I don't, I don't even notice. Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so, so uh, do I you would... guys recommend it? Or are you still in trial mode? What do you say to the audience? Should they try it? This? I can't tell. I can't I, tell yet. I'm, I'm same as Miriam, like it's fun to play with, and I haven't noticed a marked shift yet. But I am still playing with it. Okay. Uh, what, well, what perhaps we'll, we'll do a follow up on a second yeah. episode, and we'll ask yeah, you definitely. to take notes. <laughs> I definitely like it around my neck, even as a, as a conversation. <laughs> I prefer you with the red hat with the red. Uh, uh, how do you call it? The healing light. I love that one. Yeah, that's packed away somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a cool one too. All right. Uh, I just have to say I love the the um picture behind you, Miriam, with the tattoos on your hand. It's like so perfectly art like set designed. <laughs> it worked out well this with this little studio that I have in Miami. And you know funny? When I see that picture in the back of you, Miriam, I wanted to tell you the other day, for some reason it brings me to Club 54. It looks like well, a look at the wall. Oh yeah, Studio 54, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you it. know, I also have a light, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm you need a disco set ball. Set <laughs> I'm the disco ball. You're the That's disco right. ball. I love you. I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Danny, okay, let's get some audience here excited about this book. I brought up the Amazon page where you can get the book. This is the link directly from your website. I'll bring that down to the link. Um, in, in three sentences, why do they need to read this right now, especially now, given everything that's happening on the planet and the fact that we're moving into the age of Aquarius, the Barrage Noller, and how this can actually empower them? Um, because words are the most powerful real reality creation technology we have, um, I think for anyone who's, <clears throat> who's choosing to be an empowered reality creator, um, this book will attune us to the languaging habits that are disempowering us that we don't even realize and give us very simple, accessible upgrades to allow us to shift our language such that we are moving through the world as empowered badasses. I love it. It's simple and to the point. <laughs> You're amazing. Okay, and okay, so I'll bring up your Odyssey one more time here. And what's going on on top of these uh, podcasts with Emily? Is there anything else that you wanted to uh, point to the audience to here on your Odyssey channel? Um. So, so that's my personal Odyssey channel, and my Odyssey channel with Emily Moyer is called Just Words. Um. This one is, I think, Words Are Matter. Ah, okay. As far as what I'm doing right now, I'm teaching a high school homeschool class. I'm teaching kids about how language is being used to manipulate them through propaganda, uh, which is really fun. I love it. I have uh, a group coaching salon every Saturday. You can find information about that on my website. Um, you can find it on the quantum languaging site, which is that red triangle up at the top. I do one on one coaching and consulting. Right now I've been pitching <clears throat> businesses, you know, like I just pitched United Airlines and I pitched the spa here, businesses where I'm noticing there's a lot of tension and um, 
the uh, the forward facing customer service have not yet learned how to speak to people compassionately in a non polarizing way about the restrictions they're imposing. So this this was my breakthrough to get me out of my frustration with it was let me teach them how to communicate around this such that we can kind of quell the fire and the aggression and the division um, and create a more loving landscape for all of us. Oh, that's awesome. And what's the next book you're working on? Maybe I mentioned your, or you mentioned that. Yeah, it's so. Roll of the Eyes. Um, <laughs> well, only because we had a little powwow, Danny and I, yesterday. Yeah. So is that uh, the book on the erectile dif dysfunction? <laughs> no, but that yeah. should be the next, another show that we do with Danny. I'm, sure, we could do that. <laughs> Um, the book that I'm writing now is dispelling the myth of patriarchy as the fundamental issue plaguing our society and turning our attention towards hierarchy. Um, and then <clears throat> attuning people to how hierarchy has infected our language. I've divided it into their nine precepts of hierarchical languaging. And then the upgrades. I have been playing with um, the upgrade being heterarchy. But heterarchy is so clunky and not fun to say. And I'm also not entirely clear that that's the place for us to go. So um, I'm calling it betterarchy because in betterarchy, I'm saying I don't actually know what the upgrade is, but I know that once we pull um, the, well, once we pull the sort of artificial hierarchy out of language, then we're all gonna be resourced to create something better from an organic place, not just like rearranging the pieces of hierarchy and calling it progress, which it isn't. Um, but I, I, I put thought to what you're saying. I think it goes from organic to multiple levels of organic into a holographic system. So it's not gonna be the hierarchy, the pyramids and all that. So it, yeah, and I'm trying to find the words to, to describe what you just said, but humanity is going there. So having these conversations are absolutely important. I can't wait to read your book on that one. Thank you. And I love that you just said holographic and I also love, cause you totally got it. And I really love this about you is like how intuitive you are. Like I notice that I'll say one thing and you kind of jump out a few steps. Like you get it in the more macro way. And it does feel like there are going to be a few steps until we get to this holographic. And so this is a tool to help move us out of hierarchy and onto that new pathway where we'll co-create it together. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I love it. So folks, there you go. You have some homework to do. Uh, Danny, maybe uh, last words of wisdom uh, for you, maybe for the audience here. Is there anything <laughs> you feel important to share with the audience? Maybe you thought about it before coming on the show or during the show or you saw comments fly by and you said, oh, I absolutely have to say this before we leave tonight. What would that be, Danny? Uh, it would just be that Every single person listening to this, you are an empowered, sovereign reality creator. You can create your reality exactly as you want to. You are living a life of choice. And if you are living a life that you're not over the moon about, then I urge you to look at your choices and look at how you're languaging your life and switch it up. I love it. Okay, <laughs> very good. Mariam, man. You look amazing. So I don't know what you're doing, but you're you're really? glowing. I'm in Miami and <laughs> not Miami. San Francisco with a heated vest and moldy house. Right. Benvenido I, I, Miami. Thank there you, you for saying that. Um, I I would like to share what I'm working working on. I'm really happy to have had Danny, and it made me realize how much I miss you. I wish I could hug you. Mm -hmm. uh, to see your beautiful face and uh, so grateful to have you in my life as a mirror, as a teacher, as a friend, as a sister, you know, and, and there's been times where Danny and I have triggered each other or I've triggered Danny who's, uh, she told me her mom is a Capricorn <laughs> and uh, you know, sometimes friendships, they, they go like this, but to be able to be on the same page during this mass psychosis is wonderful. Yeah. Um, I did pull I did pull a card for this, but but it's not appropriate. It's the thread. I really love this deck. I it's love that deck. Pipes. And uh, I've been I've been this is really this card symbolizes being able to go within 
and connect to that source, which is all you need to kind of pull yourself back to yourself. And uh, so I pulled this card and maybe people can relate. If you're feeling lost, you're right there. Just take a moment to, to sit with yourself and your environment. If I look better is a, is true. Your epigenetics, your environment makes a big difference. The words that you hear, which can be used as weapons. And, uh, you know, we've, arguably all been training for this point. If you want to go and test out your sovereignty, well, you have an opportunity because, uh, you know, they're trying to enslave us. I, I would, uh, I'm going to be going to truth about cancer and, uh, I'm very excited to, I've been very excited to hang out with people. I had such an amazing time at Ampfest, amazing time at Bulletproof Conference, and now I'm going to be going to Tennessee, and I'm going to be sharing a booth. I'm going to be working Chrissy Mayer's booth. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a comic, and she's like, do you know about Truth About Cancer? Which, you know, this is this is my world, um, the V safety, and uh, the hill that I am willing to die on. And what else do I have going on? Please Please uh, support my, well, this is Honey Colony. So I've been doing some mini readings, which is just one question and just tapping in. I have more and more people who are reaching out. I have been commissioned to write a guide, um, a detox guide. You can imagine for what. And uh, I'm... I'm uh, that's a deep dive because I'm not a scientist and I'm, I'm, I got, I got asked from Twitter for speaking about geo and I'm like, Oh yeah, motherfuckers, I'm going to become an expert now because clearly there's something there. Uh, I want to share on my, my bee lady. Okay. So sorry, the, the honey colony, you can check out, all of our beautiful products that are made in America. If you want to do a reading with me, I'm a functional medicine consultant and coach. And those are our products. Please buzz on over to Honey Colony. And I think we should, in the future, show Simply Transformative. And if you want to support my abusive relationship with... Uh, with Jack. With Jack. Because, with Jack. Please... Yeah. I had, you know, 30,000 followers and now I'm reduced to 300. So please follow me there. I just did an amazing interview today about the airlines, the lawsuits that are going with the airlines. It's really an amazing interview. But, I but called Marianne, that's just conspiracy theory nonsense. It was, just <laughs> wet, it was just weather related. It had nothing to do with what you're talking about now. Look at <laughs> it. The following media includes potentially sensitive content and might harm you. I also I call people and I record them. I called a Colorado hospital uh, that is dealing with kidney transplants and uh, saying basically F you to certain people. And I also got the Southwest Airlines press people to emphatically say that this, all these disruptions are just about the weather. It's amazing how they are operating in friendly skies and not experiencing the other airlines are not experiencing any. Yeah, yeah. the weather's just just affecting that specific airline. There's nothing else happening for your folks. Don't you know? Just go back to sleep. <laughs> it's so to amazing sleep. that it's just one airline, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, a, it's amazing. It's fascinating. So mm. I although for... I saw some uh, reports yesterday, I think JetBlue is hot on the heels here, and perhaps we'll see more of this in the next couple. Oh of days yeah. Well. well, if you listen to that interview, you will learn about lawsuits that you likely did not know about. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's part of the identity thing. Like certain airlines are identifying as weather challenged, <laughs> while others are not. I right. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so, I mean, I it's been a whole week. For, 
like listen to this guys it's been a whole week and mainstream media can continues to ignore this and at a certain point right. everybody's like hello guys can you actually report the news like like this is absolutely ridiculous. why would they start now <laughs> <laughs> well somebody asked me because yesterday canada post here our uh, mail carrier they just put out an exemption for all of their workers to get out of this federal mandate this that is due for october 29th i'm like and somebody asked me well why isn't that on the news i'm like are you serious? You're actually right? you're actually asking me why they're not putting that on the news? Of course it's not gonna be on the news. Like, oh my god, it challenges everything on the narrative right away the minute they put it on the news. And this is also listen to this, Mariam. You'll you both will appreciate this. In Quebec, the province over here, we heard in the last couple of months that they were going to fire some of these healthcare workers for refusing to take the thing, right? And there was just a few hundred, like very like disgruntled, disrespectful, you know, anti so and so's and blah blah blah. Yeah. We just found out yesterday 22,000 have walked off and the premier just said, holy shit, 22,000. Okay, we're going to push back the deadline another month. I'm like, dude, pushing back the deadline doesn't do anything. They already called your bluff. Oh, yeah. They were ready to quit. So you're oh, yeah, they moved the deadline in Canada to November, right? Uh, right? No, 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 no. The There's federal mandate right now is still for October they... 29. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, well. I'm just, I'm a real journalist. I'm making calls. I'm not being paid for it. Please support me. I have balls and I am fearless and uh, I'm getting the answers, you know, I, and I'm doing it because I really care to find out the truth amid, amid all of these tries with what I call tries, truth mixed with lies and, and, so, so please do, do, do check out my interviews. And uh, what else did I want to say? This is the Miriam, thread. Yes. Are you open? Are you open to a yes, language? Go ahead, give me. Yes. Okay. I just want to give you two as you're open to them. One is practice saying that you and Twitter have ended your relationship. Just rule neutral. Twitter and I are no longer in relationship. Something to play with. And also, as far as you not being paid, no, you are supported by generous donations from your followers and the people who tune in to your podcasts. You're so supported by all of us who love your content and see you and appreciate everything that you do for us. There's over 724 people in the chat right now logging in to your Venmo to support you, Maria. Exactly. Your <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> For the adjustment, I, I appreciate it. I, I have to practice, definitely. Um, you get to practice. I get to practice every day. So thank you for supporting me. Thank you for valuing truth and journalism and people with balls. And this is the thread. And if you're looking to improve your health, I will help you. I am all about biohacking, optimizing biology, not making you believe you no longer have an immune system. So thank you. I thank you, Jean-Claude. And I have a lot of other guests that I'm I'm working on. I'm so happy to connect with you, Danny. I love you. Mm, I, I love, love you, Jean-Claude. Thank you both for having me. And Merci it's beaucoup. so Merci. great to see you, Miriam. I miss you so much. Yeah, I missed you too. I, I thank, yeah. Okay, I love you guys. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. I, I, anytime you guys want to come back on the show, it's a, a really, really cool. So thank I'll you so much back, everyone, for Jay joining Z, us here you. tonight. <laughs> What's that? I said I'll come back. Of course, it, well, you're already you're already on my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys are already on the schedule. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here tonight. Of course, you can find uh Danny here at Quantum Languaging dot com and also at dannycats.com are both of her websites and from there you can find the links to uh, her shop page as well as her uh odyssey channel for the um podcasts now on top of that you can find mariam here at honeycolony.com as always and on her new twitter handle at blady17 of course last but not least you can find me here at <laughs> youtube at jock at beyond mystic 3 our third backup channel wouldn't you know and we're rebuilding that community here once again so please do remember to like share and subscribe and this was the Quantum Woo with Mariam Hanin and Danny Kratz. I love you guys. Have a great evening and we'll see you soon. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye.